All right, B-listers, you know the drill. This is your official spoiler alert for the episode. If you don't want any spoilers, stop the episode now. And if you don't care about spoilers, hold on to your seats because this episode starts now. Hi, Court. And hello, fellow B Critics. Welcome to another episode of the B Critics podcast. So, this week's movie is like the godfather of movies for 2023. It's got everybody talking, it's got like a little bit of something for everyone, honestly. And I'm ready to start talking about it. <laughs> but before we really get into it, let's tell the people where to find us. So you can find the podcast on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Be Critics Podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and follow our Instagram for all the best movie content. Yes, follow the Instagram and subscribe. Subscribe to the YouTube, please. Yeah, we're okay. getting so close to 100 subscribers. So like, it's so exciting. <laughs> it's free for you. Just do it. <laughs> okay. I think it's time to get into the episode. Yes, and our guest critic for this episode is Matt Speakman. Hi, Matt. Hey. It's Hi, good Matt. To be back back for a third time. I'm like <laughs> minted in the Beat Critics Hall of Fame now. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it's time, like, this being your third episode on mm -hmm. to, like, introduce you a little bit better, like, tell the people a little bit about <laughs> you and your, like, taste in, in movies. Because one of the reasons that we wanted you to come on the podcast in the first place is because like you love movies You're and like the most knowledgeable love movie person I know to talk about <laughs> movies well that's flattering um <laughs> uh, compliment Matt hour it's time <laughs> yeah 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 um I do like try to watch as much as possible uh it's like something i'm still feel like i'm sometimes playing catch up with some people that i know because yeah. there's just so much stuff out there but yeah um, it's, it's been a really like big thing post-college for me it was like a big thing in high school my parents had like a room with a projector in it and i used to order movies off of amazon and watch <laughs> movies up there like dvds so i had mm -hmm. a really big dvd collection for a while Ooh. and i kind of ripped this thing off it's like so cheesy my my stepdad used to write down on the back of his cd collection like what songs that he liked from the albums that he had bought with a sharpie Aww. so when i was like in ninth grade i used to write down like my star rating on the back of my dvd case like oh, what really? of the That's movies so that cool. i used to watch <laughs> which is this is like lame as fuck but no it's still, not cool. <laughs> but still uh and now i just do that and it's like socialized in the form of letterbox yeah now it's cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah was your personal rating system a five-star system um i think i did it like i actually think i did like a pitchfork not a star thing like a pitchfork sort of thing where it was like okay. out of 10 and it was like point something point something and the funny thing about that is is like just oh, okay. no criteria involved at all it's just like yeah this feels like an 8.6 <laughs> I'm like, okay, what the fuck? Gotta go with your mean? gut. You know, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, Kill Bill Volume Two. That's like an eight point one. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds fair to me. Yeah. Maybe we can do a version of our ratings at the end using your yeah. personal yeah, rating the, the system. The map speaking back of the DVD rating. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we can add it to all of your episodes. Yeah, <laughs> which I guess has become sort of like the the guy from fucking uh, Barstool is like pizza shit he does that too <laughs> but i'm removing myself from that from that link of the chain <laughs> no this is a matt speakman original you were doing this well yeah. before <laughs> yeah ninth grade that's that was a long time ago mm -hmm. and i was Almost watching some ninth grade now. boy shit too so <laughs> <laughs> which i mean also included christopher nolan so <laughs> yeah, I mean the Batman movies. Yeah. I think it is time because we have a lot to talk about 
to get into the movie. So Matt, will you introduce today's movie? Yeah, so um, I thought about busting out my my uh, nuclear explosion glasses and my sunscreen for this, <laughs> but I decided not to. Um, but today we're, <laughs> even though Benny Safty would be really upset with me for not doing that, today we are talking yes. about Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. Oh, what a fitting sound effect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be a a good discussion it's gonna be a long discussion there is like Mm -hmm. so much to talk about i mean it's a three-hour movie courtney i know it's gonna be a long talk (laughs) i know and matt i know you really liked this movie and so did you liz so Mm -hmm. i'm really excited to talk about it with both of you um because like i mentioned i was reading i've been reading the book american prometheus like ever since i watched it rewatched it on sunday um so I'm excited to talk about it too. So I'll give the little synopsis. Oppenheimer tells the story of J. Robert Oppenheimer, otherwise known as the father of the atomic bomb. During World War II, Oppenheimer was appointed appointed by Lieutenant General Leslie Groves to run the Manhattan Project, the highly secretive war effort leading a team of scientists to develop the atomic bomb. The movie portrays the life of Oppenheimer leading up to this appointment, the world's first ever nuclear nuclear explosion in a war effort and the aftermath in the political world in a fascinating nonlinear way. The story examines the wartime decisions and political moves made after the war, as well as J. Robert Oppenheimer's personal motivations and ambitions by following the lenses of both the life story of J. Robert Oppenheimer and political aspirations of Presidential Medal of Freedom winner Louis Strauss. Wow. The guy. Meaty, meaty history. Are you guys history buffs? Because I don't know shit about any of that. History. I mean, okay. I don't know a ton about it, but especially this era, like I am like World War II, all about it. All about it. Okay. I am not by any means. I know I said I'm reading the book, but I'm honestly like baffled that I'm reading the book and enjoying it because mm-hmm. typically I'm not a history person. Yeah. If you stay tuned for the end of this episode, I have some like fact versus fiction, like a little game that we're going to play. So we'll really test that history. I'm going to not know any of those. (laughs) Oh, it's going to be a game? Yeah. Maybe having read the book or half of the book I'm halfway through will help me in that realm. Maybe. We'll see. Maybe. So this movie we already mentioned is three hours long. Very long. Yes. It's rated R. It came out this year. It was produced by Syncopy, Alice Entertainment, and produced by Universal Pictures. It is the first like big movie that Nolan's done that wasn't Warner Brothers, which is kind of notable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, big time. Um, I think we talked about that a lot in our like spoiler-free version of this movie. Yeah. Oh, here's our opportunity to plug that one. If you haven't yeah. seen um, Oppenheimer, but you want to hear about it without hearing spoilers, you can x out of here and go to the spoiler free version until you see the movie because after this point there's going to be some spoilers so just keep that in mind yes huge dub for uh universal by the way just Mm want to say that they locked down jordan peele for like they got him and then now they got this movie like Mm -hmm. good for them yeah fuck warner brothers too so oh shit i mean just a little bit i mean they're guys so the not guy are... like <laughs> the recent warner brothers movies that came out uh i mean they're fine but it's just like they're the guy who runs warner brothers is a moron and all the dc it. stuff is just like so like devoid of anything interesting mm-hmm. except for like i don't know the suicide squad remake so it's kind of cool that Nolan's shifting gears a little bit. Yeah. And Universal's time. backing uh like Artur filmmakers too, like people who really are in control. So Yeah. Giving them the like them free reign almost. Yeah. Well not really shouting out studios because right now they're fucking over all their actors and writers, but you know. We're promoting <laughs> nobody here. <laughs> yeah. Other than ourselves. <laughs> and Christopher Nolan. We like him. Mm-hmm. We do like Christopher Nolan. Um, so he wrote the screenplay, mm-hmm. but it's based on a book by Kai Bird and Martin Sherwin. I already mentioned it, but it's called American Prometheus, and it's a biopic of um, J. Robert Oppenheimer. So this 
movie is like a biography of um, Oppenheimer. Mm-hmm. And it's got an original score by Ludwig Gerenson. Gorenson. He's a very intimidating looking man. I was like doing some like light research on this movie and I was like, who the heck is this guy? The composer. I'm like, goodness. <laughs> yeah, it's it's some really intense music. Um, it's very intense. Oh, yes. I have a little note about the music. They intentionally did not use any drums because drums are like traditionally and historically associated with military which didn't feel fitting mm. for the story of Oppenheimer. No. Wow. Even though they comment on the military all throughout the movie. He's not a military man. He tried to be for a hot second wearing his military he, uniform. He did try to be. And yeah. he looked great in the uniform, but he looked much better <laughs> in his cutesy little suit. Tweed jackets. Love yeah, it. Yeah, and the tiniest of ties. <laughs> yeah. <Very> skinny. <laughs> Yeah. So this movie has a extremely notable cast, and I'm only going to mention just a few of them here. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we've got our girl Florence Pugh, Shout but out girl. the man of the hour who plays Oppenheimer is Killian Murphy. We've also got Emily Blunt, Robert Downey Jr., Matt Damon, Rami Malek, Josh Peck, Gary Oldman, among many, many others. Mm-hmm. Lots and lots of people. Yes. Yeah. Um. Is this where, are we going to at some point talk about who our favorite, like, random ass people showing up in this movie are? Because I feel like. Now's feel the time, like Matt. It's really no more, crazy. No better time than like, the present. The amount of people who, like, show up in this movie, specifically yes. just white guys, like, yes. there's just so many white guys in this movie, mm-hmm. and they all pop up. And to me, they're all good in it, too. Like, mm-hmm. I, was trying, I was trying to think, like, who I thought was, I mean, Killian Murphy obviously is like the achievement of this movie. I feel like, like he mm-hmm. is asked to do so much in it, but there are just so many good supporting performances. Like Dane DeHaan is in this and he's just like super good in it after like the only thing I'd ever seen him in was like the amazing Spider-Man two, which was like not good at all <laughs> and david crumholtz who's like oppenheimer's little you know the guy who's always like chatting him up and giving him advice mm-hmm. like he's fantastic in it too so like that that was kind of a thing that like got this movie a lot of press was i feel like it was just like every day they were like hitting the plus sign on some random like actor like i mean josh mm-hmm. peck is obviously that's that was, the that's most my ridiculous favorite one edition. yeah that's yeah like probably my biggest crush growing up i had like yeah. a soft spot in my heart for him and just like i was like oh my god there he is just like ah, I, it's so exciting i want to know who set that up they're like yeah you know who'd be great for this josh, josh peck, peck the guy who <laughs> crashed his car making a vine <laughs> they probably put some feelers out there like we're gonna need like a lot of people like who's interested and Josh Peck's yeah. manager was like, uh, we are. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite random character was definitely Gary Oldman. Because oh, yeah. I was just baffled, one, that it was him playing that role. And two, like, I love him. So Which character I, is he? He's, he's a pres- the president. Yeah, Truman. Yeah. Okay. If y'all haven't nope. figured this out by now, me and, like, actors or singers, like, and names <laughs> just, like, well, he doesn't look like himself like at no, all. No, not at all. I was all. like, you would I never didn't even know that him. was him until I after. Didn't either. I, I texted yeah. my friend and my friend was like, oh my God, like uh, Gary Oldman was like Truman in that. And, you know, he got a lot of, he won an Oscar for playing, um, oh my gosh, Winston Churchill in that mm-hmm. one movie. And he did a lot of makeup and stuff for that too. So I remember texting my friend and being like, he's just like collecting World War II yeah. figures. And I didn't even know that was him. My friend was like, you just got old men. <laughs> <laughs> that's like his thing now. It's like getting Rick rolled. Yeah. Liz, you would know him as Sirius Black in the Harry Potter series. We talked uh, about yeah. him yesterday or two yeah. years ago, mm. whatever it was. <laughs> Doesn't look anything like no. President Truman. <laughs> no, he looks kind of like chunky a little bit in this. Yeah. Well, he looks different when he's older. A little so bit. So I think I was like think chunky. trying to think about when like just thinking about the cast, like what my like two or three favorite ones. So I think like mm-hmm. obviously 
you know, Killian's one, like we're just going to ignore him and Robert Downey Jr.'s two. So yeah. we're just going to ignore him too. Outside of them, I was like, I think the big three for me is Crumholtz, who I described earlier is like the guy who's like just swooping in and like being like, hey, it's all right, buddy. He was really he good at it. Isidore Robbie. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, yeah, he's like Oppenheimer. He's like goofy and emotional <laughs> support. And then I thought um, uh, Alden Ehrenreich who people may know from the Han Solo movie that yes. didn't do super well. I thought he was good too. Yeah, he was like uh, Leopold Strauss's like little guy who kind of like, and it's He's really like funny because he gets an person. amazing, yeah, he gets like the amazing line at the movie where they do it. They like tease uh, Robert or... Uh, no, John F. Kennedy, like he's a Marvel character or whatever. Mm-hmm. They like name mm-hmm. drop him. Like, yeah. <laughs> Some like, guy okay, named whatever. John yeah. Andrew Kennedy. The crazy yeah. thing about Alden Enric is Aaron Reich, as I said. Yeah, his Aaron Reich. Reich is he's not even a named character. He His character wow. is Senate aide. So that just mm-hmm. goes to show how many like good actors are in this movie as supporting characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he, um, he like, I bought a lot of stock in him like really early on because mm-hmm. he's in Hail Caesar, which is a Coen Brothers movie, mm-hmm. and he's he's incredible in it, like so good. And then they casted him in Solo, and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And he does a pretty good job in it, but it kind of tanked his career for a little bit. Yeah, because that movie is like just okay. That, yeah, but now he's yeah. back. Because he's in this, he's in a movie that did really well at Sundance, and he's about to be in an erotic thriller for Netflix called Fair Play. That's supposed to be really mm-hmm. good too. So that sounds it's good. Aaron Reich season. Strap yeah. in. I never yeah. sold my stock, so <laughs> we're on the come up now. <laughs> What's your third? My third. Okay, it's. I'm thinking that it's either. Dane DeHaan, who I thought, like, particularly in the scenes where, um, like, they're all sitting at the round table in black and white and they keep having to move the little, like, plate. He mm-hmm. was, like, incredible in that scene. And then Benny Safty doing the accent is, like, just so funny to me that I wanted yeah, him Safdie. To, to be Safdie in there. Was a good one. And another thing that I wanted to do really quick was <laughs> so this has been a, a, a joke that there's so many people in this movie, you know? Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. I wanted to uh, name off like six other guys, (laughs) actors who are like in this kind of realm. And y'all got to give me like, yes or no, whether you think we could find a part for them in this movie. Okay. (laughs) Okay. All right. My first one is Daniel Radcliffe. (laughs) Oh gosh. I feel like that would have been distracting. (laughs) No. You think so? I mean, Robert Downey Jr. is in it. Yeah, but okay. Daniel Radcliffe is such a good actor. Yeah. He could pull anything off. He could make I've... him a woman. It would be great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, my next one is um, Barry Keoghan from, uh, like, Killing of a Sacred Deer, and he's in... Um... Yes, 100% could be oh, in okay. this movie. The creepy guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the creepy guy. Yeah, He could have been one be... of the random German physicists. Yeah, yeah, just being a little freak somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And then <laughs> John Magaro, who is in Past Lives, he's like the he's the guy who gets cucked in Past Lives, you know. He's also like in the that. big he's in the Big Short too. I feel like yeah. he's just in everything random. He one hundred percent could have been in this as like a classmate, one of Oppie's like close friends. I think he gives yeah. that vibe a little bit. And this this next one, this guy's like he he might not have been on anybody's like radar. To, it it would have been too late maybe for him to be blowing up for him to be in it. But Paul Meskel was my next one. That I was mm. like, let's get Paul Meskel and Oppenheimer. Yeah, you know? I don't he, know who he is. He's um, he's an after son. And um, normal people. Have you ever heard of normal people? Yes. Who, yeah, he's the guy, and and oh, he dated okay, Phoebe okay. Bridgers and. Oh. Yeah. He Let's could BB Bridgers in there. <laughs> <laughs> While we're naming names. She we definitely needed what? more female yeah. energy in this movie. I agree. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Every Nolan movie ever. 
They were all kind of crappy too. Like they were all bad people. There was no like shining star female character. No. Okay, so we're in on Radcliffe. We're in on Q and we're yeah. I'm in on Megaro. Yeah, that's I'm vetoing that. And then uh but no Mescal. <laughs> I think that's good. No. You think no Mescal? I mean I think I any know. white He's guy like... could have been in this. He looks a little Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's not. He's yeah. Irish. He's got big, like, leading man energy now, though. So, because he's only so? been in, I mean, After Sun. He, that's, like, his yeah, biggest thing, and he was nominated for an Oscar for it. So. This movie gives leading man energy as a supporting character. Yeah, vibes, that's true. You know? So, like, mm. <laughs> yep. leading man, but not that leading. And since we're on this subject, I did okay. want to bring up, so, like, before. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just gonna bring up like Rami Malik real we're quick. On the subject. <laughs> Rami Malik, just real quick, as a guy yeah. who gets bullied number one, he was also <laughs> really good too. Yeah, I like that he came in at the end and was like the hero, basically. Yeah, gave the like yeah. Kendall Roy succession speech, basically. <laughs> I really bought into the fact that he was like just such like a nerdy like timid guy like with like you know the kind of like pushing up the glasses like nerdy vibe that was what i was getting from they were him. like and... slapping binders and shit out of his hand he was like <laughs> <laughs> guy. yeah and like the scene where he tries to get like oppenheimer to sign his little like petition I oh yeah just... yeah it was misunderstood well there were bigger things at stake here we go. Um, okay. Do you have anything else about the cast, Matt? Or is that... We... No, that's it. I think you guys okay. nailed it. With, like, <laughs> there's like two women and like all they do is like... but It's like one just has sex with them and then the other one is just like the wife who does come up clutch at the end. I mean, that that's a problem like in every Nolan movie is like, you know, that's he gets a yeah. lot of shit for that like all the time. So yeah, it's interesting like reading the book. I think that um because one of my biggest qualms with this movie is uh Emily Blunt and Kitty Oppenheimer. And I just think like I don't know, like she makes me kind of feel like uneasy inside. Um but I I think that Florence Pugh's character Jean Tatlock is like actually portrayed pretty well like mm-hmm. from uh, how she's portrayed in the book but I think that Nolan definitely took some liberties with um, Emily Blunt's mm-hmm. character and made her like a little bit darker than she really was which I think is just like the dramatic way he wanted it to be in this screenwriting because that's how he always portrays women is like very dark and dramatic but yeah, yeah I I also like I'm not sure how just like on board I was with her performance too. Like, yeah, me neither. I mean, I think she's like a really, really good actor, um, but she's not. She's given like a couple things to really chew on. Like, obviously, like you know, she gets like a really great moment in the movie, um, but I felt like they didn't really like deploy her talents mm-hmm. like super well. In this movie, is, is what I, I agree. Would say, they she, could have given yeah. her like a little bit more depth, and they didn't give her character any depth at all. She was just like this hardened housewife, communist member, and like mm-hmm. I, was, uh, I really mm-hmm. enjoyed Emily Blunt, but also I just love okay. Emily Blunt, and so mm-hmm. like I was just like, yes, girl. And I felt like Kitty was almost kind of like because like at the time, like women were housewives, kind of thing, like. The fact that there's only one female scientist like in his class and then there's like the one woman that they let work at Los Alamos. Like she's kind of like breaking a little bit out of that mold and being like the like badass. Mm -hmm. She's like in on it. She understands his work and he like confides in her a lot of things that he's working on that he really shouldn't be telling anyone. And she like has to live with a lot of that information and so I feel like it kind of made sense for her to be this kind of dark and twisted person because she was doing everything by herself. She didn't really seem mm-hmm. like she wanted kids and they had kids. And that kind of threw into threw her into a spiral. And he gets he would probably come home and tell her about his day and it was probably a bad day and she had to take on all of that. 
Yeah. Um, so I, I think I think it made sense for the time period and also giving that character more of a presence versus having her just be the, the housewife of J. Robert Oppenheimer. I'm glad Audrey that you Parker. I'm glad that you got that impression because Kitty was not just a housewife. She had a degree and she was a botanist and like mm-hmm. she had a career. Um, and they didn't really show that in the movie because she actually worked at Los Alamos too for a little bit as a like a science tech of some sort. Um, yeah, but there probably just like I, wasn't room like in the movie because it wasn't. Oh, about of course her. not. Yeah, it's already so, three hours long. The only way for them <laughs> we to haven't even started that. the outline yet, and we're twenty six yeah. minutes. Into I mean, the movie. that's one of the big. <laughs> you know, her character <laughs> needed like to be a little controversial. Yeah, that's one of the big. You know, mm. I guess like challenges you're going to run up trying to make a fully fleshed out movie like this about someone's life is some things are going to go by the wayside and they can't you know you can't you can't spend as much time like building their relationship as maybe like i hate to say this but and i'm glad this isn't that but like if this was like a you know six part hbo miniseries like they could spend more time like fleshing out their relationship that is one of the like Mm -hmm one or two things that i don't like as much as like it, it's not it's less about like her performance because i don't think her performance is her fault but it's like they i just didn't feel like them mm-hmm. two had a lot of like on stream like on screen chemistry and and like i don't know just the whole their relationship to me in general was one of the weaker points of the movie but at the same time, though, some of the scenes that they have together are, like, incredibly effective because, like, the writing's great and they're both just top-of-the-line talents, basically. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So before we really get into it, Matt, we have to bring up the whole, like, Barbenheimer situation. Um, mm-hmm. And so I'm curious to know if you participated – in barbenheimer so i like didn't properly. do yeah i didn't do them back to back um that's just a lot and i went <laughs> i went to like so opening weekend i was out of town on vacation so i didn't get to go thursday or friday i came back mm-hmm. sunday and i went sunday night to see oppenheimer at a regal which like I should go see it again because the theater down the street from me is just like not that good of a theater. And they put mm-hmm. it in like, it was one of those theaters where they definitely just have like one, they have like a big theater and then the rest of them are just sort of like smaller offshoots. And they threw Oppenheimer like in the smaller, one of the smaller like offshoots, which is fair. Cause Barbie's like the real money driver here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then I saw Barbie the next night at the same theater in the big like the big screening room with all of mm-hmm. the people and stuff yeah. and and I saw both of them by myself both <laughs> packed theaters um did not wear pink because I realized I don't own anything pink which is weird I feel like That's at some sad. point I would have gathered That's yeah I know I should have gone out and like bought something um so I guess I would say I like half participated I saw both in theaters like within the first four days of them coming out so yeah i feel like that's participation yeah (laughs) i think so i mean i i went to see it opening weekend both movies and i saw barbie twice in that weekend also um but i i guess i didn't do them on the same day but back to back days that would have been difficult i don't think seeing them back to back is like the optimal way to do it i feel Mm -hmm. like after seeing both of them, I had so many thoughts that I would have been so distracted in the second screening that I would have had to yeah. see it again anyway. Yeah, they both have a lot to say and they both have mm-hmm. a lot to think about. So it's like if you're just like, you know, throwing one in your brain and then immediately trying to make room for the other, I feel like you're not going to like digest it. Because, I mean, after I saw this movie, I had this whole like time in my head where i was like oh my god all of these things were just like incredible and then Mm -hmm. and then in barbie like i won't say spoilers or anything but at the end like the end of that movie is just so like rich and like Mm -hmm. like there's so much thought you have to put into it and think about like 
the way that they position the end of that movie too like it really goes out on like a pretty existential note too so i don't know like if if you did the whole full day at the theater like that's really awesome but i would agree and say like removed from the bit of it all like you should have there should be like a day break or something yeah at least take a lunch break or something (laughs) something Mm -hmm. get out of the theater go see some sunshine yeah (laughs) yeah and with the barbenheimer thing i mean like when you think about it like this movie in particular the one we're talking about oppenheimer like it benefited a lot from coming out on the same day more so more than in the other direction i would say Mm -hmm. like barbie to me like if you're asking me which one's the better movie like i probably would say this one like i like this one a little more but barbie was definitely the driver of this whole thing like that movie is one of the most successful movies now Mm -hmm. that's ever been released so it's sick that like because these two movies came out on the same day like more people watched this one too like who wouldn't have normally gone and seen it Mm -hmm. because of barbie's like success too like if this movie came out another time i think it would have been like successful in theaters because nolan movies usually are but the fact that like barbie like you know that that's an event that we haven't seen in a while and the pairing of these two together definitely allowed people to watch this one too like because of I guess the joke, like in quotation marks of it all to you. So now let's get into the movie. So the film is broken into two stories and they're intertwined and it jumps around in the timeline a bunch. But we have Fission, which is a recollection of J. Robert Oppenheimer's life and career based on his testimony to a security clearance council in 1954. And then the second part is Fusion, a counterpoint from the perspective of Admiral Louis Strauss during his confirmation hearings to become Secretary of Commerce in 1959. And to me, this movie, like you wouldn't think it, because it's jumping around so much, you know, it, it can mm-hmm. be kind of hard to to really like nail it down. But to me, it really is like kind of three act structure in a little bit because you have the beginning and then you have the Los Alamos stuff. And then like it goes straight black and white hearing stuff at the end. Like they yeah. weave in some of the ones like they're all weaving in each other. But you can really like I feel like slice it into those three like big sections of the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's very classic Christopher Nolan to make a movie like this where he like I, he doesn't always jump around in the timeline in his movies, mm-hmm. but that is kind of cla- like kind of. But I think it was confusing the first time you watch it. Like I think it makes a lot more sense the second time it, you view it. I don't know how y'all feel about that. I've only seen it once, so. <laughs> Yeah, I think I've seen it one time too, but it I would say this movie is less confusing than Dunkirk is. Like okay. Dunkirk, I think, which I think that's like five star masterpiece movie. Like timeline wise, Dunkirk to me is harder to follow than this one is. I think mm-hmm. that's intentional too, but I would say like yeah, it is a little confusing. I would say the most confusing like aspect of it is when they like the only thing that really like confused me was his like initial meeting with Strauss and how that shows up like super early in the movie. Yeah. And then it becomes obviously a really big scene like later on in the movie. At yeah. first when I was watching it, I was like, okay, what the fuck is this all about? Like <laughs> what's why is everybody storming off? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what Matt's talking about is the very is it like the first scene in the movie? It's it's pretty early on. It may I mean, yeah, maybe the first. Um but it's it's a scene of Strauss attempting to get Oppenheimer to lead the Institute of Advanced Study. But what happens is um Oppenheimer has a chat with Albert Einstein and Strauss thinks that Oppenheimer says something to Einstein about him and so he gets paranoid and it comes back up later in the movie. Mm-hmm. 
but the the structure as far as the storytelling i don't know about y'all but i was sitting there the first especially like the first two because the first two hours of this movie i would say are kind of like unlike anything that i've like really ever seen before Mm -hmm. in terms of the editing and the story structure i would agree with that the way they tell it and how they make a biopic this fast pace and then it just turns into like kind of a procedural core drama i feel like in the last like hour which to yeah. me worked i know a lot of people are saying they don't like the third act or whatever as much but i wanted to know like if y'all f- had ever like seen a movie like this that's telling the story of someone's life like this in such a rapid fast pace like i mean the cuts in this movie are crazy like yeah. it's so mm-hmm. fast the cuts are so fast. The dialogue is so fast. And it has to be because it's packed with so much information. Yeah. Um, I When we did our spoiler-free episode, I likened this movie to a mixture of where the crawdads sing and interstellar. So you get like the court drama type style of the way where the crawdads sing portrays that story and it's telling the story of this girl's life and how it unfolds and then the editing style and the way that the scenes are shot and all the different types of scenes reminded me a lot of interstellar which is one of christopher nolan's that makes sense Mm -hmm. but that was like kind of how i like felt watching it I don't know. Y'all tell us. I don't know what movies it seems like, but that was like as close as I could get. Yeah, I disagree with that stance about it being like where the crawdads sing. And I disagree I don't think with it. That movie. I don't think it has anything to do with that movie. The only like the only yeah. part of it that I feel like it kind of makes like at least a little bit is that it's like telling the story through a court, like through a hearing or a court case. Mm-hmm. I mean, with that argument you could like argue that it's like the harry potter movie where well, maybe they're is. doing the court cases and and chopping around from people i mean I, I think i don't think it's like that movie but matt to your point i think it isn't really like anything i've ever seen before because like in the beginning i think they're trying to express that like oppenheimer's going through it and so they like do all these like crazy fast cut scenes that cut between like him going through something like early on in his life and then like you see visions of like atomic nuclear bombs like early on in the movie you know so you see that like his mind is like in a million places at once Mm -hmm. yeah i think like um uh structurally like you can make comparisons between this movie and a lot of other movies like yeah that's fair like i i've never seen where the crawdads sing so i don't know but like i mean another one that comes to mind is like the social network is told in a really similar yeah. way where it's like they keep cutting back between you know two different court cases but the scenes in those movies are in that movie are long like they're like long yeah. takes and they're talking a lot like there's but this one it's like yeah i think uh i mean there's obviously like a thematic purpose to it in terms of like how it's edited and the way that it cuts is because his mind at at least in the first hour or so was just so all over the place. It seems like something they're really trying to drive home is like, Mm -hmm. he can't sleep because his mind is so like, like crazy. I think they're trying to really drive home the fact that like, you know, this is the mark of an important genius, I guess. And they're trying to show you like, you got to convince your audience that this man is different from other people. And I think, through the like breakneck storytelling and the editing and the music that we mentioned earlier because the music to Mm -hmm. me is fantastic in this movie they they Mm -hmm. definitely achieve that purpose and all three of those things together is where i say like i haven't seen a movie like this because i i just like the social network or something along those lines like a movie about someone are normally just told like okay here's what happened Mm-hmm. This movie, I think, is like trying to do something a little different. Yeah, yeah. it's telling multiple stories too. Mm-hmm. So you get like real raw information about a lot of people, which is neat. And Liz, I think um, to your point with where the crawdads sing, this movie does feel a little bit like a mystery. 
And so maybe that's the aspect that you're pulling in because you're trying to piece together all the stories and how are they connected and why are why are we clipping back to – Is he guilty? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's <laughs> – yeah. This um, movie is also surprisingly funny. I uh, thought – there were parts where I was laughing. Yeah. I think they there was like a couple like – jokes where the characters would like make a joke to the other characters and you're like huh mm-hmm. they're like dad jokes almost <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> i was like completely like encaptured watching this movie they give matt damon like all the matt damon lines in the whole yes. world so <laughs> yeah yeah um and so i don't know if y'all noticed this throughout the movie but there's certain points where um and I, when I saw this, I saw it in a historic theater in Atlanta and I saw it in 70 millimeter. And so, so cool. I kind of likened what I'm about to tell y'all to it just being like an older theater. And mm-hmm. um, this being like, I saw it like advanced screening. I saw it along with the um, Atlanta Jewish Film Festival. And so I kind of just likened it to like, this is like the only advanced screening. And so they maybe like, they just like weren't like all the way prepared because no one's seen it yet kind of thing. But at points in the movie, some of the dialogue is kind of hard to hear. And it sounds like maybe there's like a volume setting issue or something. But actually what that is, is Christopher Nolan didn't want to go back and do any like um, like re-recording for the audio. And so the mm-hmm. audio you're hearing is the audio that's captured on the IMAX and Pantone cameras. Cool. So when you're losing some of that audio, it's because whatever's going on is like like interacting with the audio that the actors are actually like speaking in the moment. Yeah, he uh, I feel like just stuff like that, like sound like if you go into a Christopher Nolan movie, you, like like you just should expect to have to listen really hard. Yeah. yeah. Like Tenet, I, I have not, <laughs> Tenet's the only one of his movies that I haven't seen, but I remember when it came out, people were catching, like giving it a lot of shit because you just like couldn't hear long strips of dialogue. It was hard it. to understand what was going on in that movie. I could not understand <laughs> the dialogue at all. I yeah. feel like I less like, um, I there there were probably a couple lines in this movie where I was like, what? <laughs> like you know well, like man, like, like, person, you know. <laughs> yeah exactly but i i don't think i had like a ton of issues especially like in some of the bigger scenes like i probably missed a line or two here and there but he's always doing shit like that though mm-hmm. yeah yeah he like um because like right after the movie came out people were complaining about it i think People complain about whatever. People were finding like random things to complain about. Like there was one scene where they show the American flag and it's the modern American flag. It's not the one that was flown in that time period. (laughs) That's actually kind of a miss in my opinion. Whatever. But anywho, people are just like trying to find stuff wrong with it. And so like he appeared in an interview and they're like, people said they can't hear your dialogue. And he's like, well, this is why like the cameras aren't soundproof and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, it's a stylistic thing. Like, take it or leave it yeah. yeah and that's when being a director is so sick because like people are like i can't hear your movie and you're like yeah i did that on purpose Fucking fuck off idiot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you weren't supposed to hear it asshole yeah and then yeah. later he's like going back and he's like oh shit they couldn't hear it <laughs> i feel like of all the christopher nolan movies i've seen though this is the one i've like least felt like that i think the only reason mm-hmm. i felt anything about the dialogue was because it was so so fast and quick and you had to be really really paying attention and there were a lot of names you had to keep up with and like that was the confusing part of this movie not the volume yeah Yeah, i think so too like it's it it was hard to keep up with who everyone was but i feel like every single character that they like were like we're gonna try and make you care about this character and what they had to say i feel like they succeeded almost on like Mm -hmm. at least like 98 percent of them well, I think casting them so strongly helped too with that. Mm-hmm. So one thing we have to talk about is the black and white film in this movie. So we get a really unique brand new 70 millimeter in black and white um, made just for this movie by Kodak. 
Yeah, and that's, that's to improve the quality because when they go back and edit color out of the film, it de- it diminishes the quality. Yeah. So in order to keep that like crisp, because when you look at it, it's you're so like, crisp. oh my gosh, like this is truly yeah. like real black and white. Um, they wanted Nolan wanted to keep the quality, so that's why he like pulled some strings and called in a favorite Kodak, and they're like, of course we will do this for you. Called mm-hmm. in a favorite Kodak. Yeah. <laughs> hey it's guys, off at my energy, honestly. Yeah. It's Christopher <laughs> Nolan things. I mean, they, yeah. not to bullshit, but that's the reason, like why it's so great that someone mm-hmm. like this is making this movie because yeah. you know you get some random ass director who's directed a couple things to do something you don't get those sort of technical the attention to detail and the care mm-hmm. and like the way it looks like he obviously is like not only a really good writer and he's just a master of like the technical aspects of of mm-hmm. things and all of his movies have always been like that yeah another like this is very like you'll like when you hear it you're gonna be like oh of course because it's christopher nolan so when they were casting this movie um christopher nolan was still like finalizing um what the screenplay was gonna be and so a lot of the actors didn't know who they were gonna be in the movie they just knew they were gonna be in it what? and he was like, I don't want to tell these people. Like, obviously, the main people, like Emily Blunt mm-hmm. and Killian yeah. Murphy and Robert Downey Jr., like, they knew who they were going to be. But a lot of the other characters, like, potentially Josh Peck and those the other people we talked about didn't know. They were just like, I'm going to be in a Christopher Nolan movie, and I don't care, like, because I'm going to be in it. Well, so. yeah, for someone like Josh Peck, that does make sense. I think he would just be happy to be anybody. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> I don't know that they would know like, just any like yeah just anybody it's like I want to be in this Christopher Nolan movie yeah no that's what I'm saying I think people do that for like Wes, and- Wes Anderson movies too they just like want to be in them yeah yeah and that helps I mean the reputation helps in that scenario like I'm sure yeah Liz like you said there were so many people who were like oh Christopher Nolan wants me to be in it sure don't care <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> like <laughs> I'm going to play a Nazi? Fine. Yeah. That is <laughs> true. I didn't really even think about that. Josh Peck even gets like a super cool character. He's the director of the Trinity Test. I thought yeah. he did fabulous. I was Legit. so proud of him. He's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> he was good. Maybe we could have gotten Drake in it if he wasn't such a piece of shit. Yeah. <laughs> could have oh had God. the duo back together. Liz, you were telling me something earlier about the black and white film. And how it's used within the movie. Oh, yeah. So so you've got the color, which is like super, super vivid color. And then you've got the black Mm -hmm. and white, which is like those is like super stark contrast. And the reason that he did that is to differentiate between the objective portions of the film and the subjective portions. So the subjective, which is like the recollections of J. Robert Oppenheimer are in color, full color. And then all the objective scenes, which are like factual scenes, like this is what happened, are the black and white scenes, which is kind of cool. That is really cool. And it's also like, it seems like it's, you know, when you're going to tell a story like that, you need visual cues to help people be like, okay, now we're on track. Like the black and white. Yeah, dream versus present time. Yeah, like the black and white helps you know where in time you are. Too. yeah the like, line yeah like if it was all in color i'd be like okay whoa <laughs> <laughs> yeah that would definitely make it what confusing. time even is it <laughs> yeah which of the 1950s yeah but i think yeah. that's interesting that it's not just used only as a time mm-hmm. piece in the movie it's used to kind of differentiate between a lot of what's like you say subjective but it, a lot of it is um based on like accounts of people and things that aren't necessarily fact like it's things that you're kind of like like he said assuming about the portrayal of Oppenheimer Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. um while we're talking about the film and stuff uh, something I think is really interesting not just about this movie but most of if not all of Christopher Nolan's films that he's done on um, like 70 millimeter or 35 millimeter is that he doesn't do deleted scenes 
and none of his movies will ever have a director's cut, he makes mm. sure that the script and the scenes are mapped out so perfectly that there's no waste because it's really expensive to shoot on film. Mm. Yeah. And so to keep like his budgets down, that's what he does. And they, I'm sure they do multiple takes, but they don't have any fluff. There's nothing they cut out. There's no changing the story. The script is the story, which I think for this one particularly is like super fascinating because that's just crazy that everything that he envisioned being in that movie is in that movie, every single piece. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's the craft. Like, that's like, that's not only impressive from just like a, like, storytelling sense and like, that's just like impressive as like a <laughs> director of humans and like legit, yeah. that's it. like this movie, like, <laughs> outside of the hands of someone who hasn't because he's already went through something with dunkirk which i'm sure was just like crazy that he like the amount of people that he had to wrangle for that and how precise like some of the explosions and stuff had to be like mm -hmm. he's got that experience and that's why this movie is in such trusted hands with him because he seems like not only you know all of these superlatives where he's you know a great writer of tension and like and has some great dialogue and obviously has a master of like the technical aspect, but everything's just like, so like precise and you don't ever hear about like, Oh, there was this like weird logistical issue on set. Mm -hmm. and now we have to delay it. Like everything. He just seems like he's just got it down. Like, yeah. and he's, like it's crazy to think about like something like you just said, because that stuff is really expensive. Like, to do and so like that's why these studios trust him i feel like to make they're like oh yeah we'll just give you this amount of money to make this mm -hmm. biopic about the guy who invented the nuclear bomb and put it in billions of theaters worldwide because mm -hmm. like he knows what he's doing mm -hmm. <laughs> obviously yeah. Yeah. it's yeah, interesting one... that you bring up the explosions too because those were all like real there's no yeah. CGI um, all used practical for all effects. of that. Yeah. And they, like, obviously it's not to scale. They didn't actually set off an atomic bomb. Yeah. But they did, um, like, use, like, different metals and elements and things to make the explosions look the same and appear the same. Like, that, like, bright white light that comes off of it is, like, actually what the bomb looked like. And so they had to like play around with how they were going to replicate that, which is kind of cool. That's so wild to me. Honestly, y'all knew that motherfucker was going to cut the sound when they <laughs> dropped the bomb to you. Yeah, you? I was like, he's. That's like, I was like, when that was happening, I was like, oh yeah, of course. Because <laughs> they were just waiting, and I, yeah. I was like reading about, um, like what, like the actual Trinity test, like somebody saying, somebody that was there when it actually happened and recalling it versus like what they showed in the film and they were saying like the sound really did lag for that long it was like a good minute and a half to two minutes before they heard anything after it went off yeah which so it's just kind of them like sitting there like waiting like like yeah in their glasses and sunscreen. <laughs> hey, I would have been there with them with the sunscreen. Nothing's happening to this skin, okay? Every yeah. not single burned. one of those guys who would like, <laughs> like go to peek around the corner to look at the, look at it. I was like, what are you doing? You don't have sunscreen on. You are gonna yeah. burn your face. Not the move. Mm -hmm. And the guy that was in the car because he was like, the windshield is gonna protect me. That person actually did that, like in real life. <laughs> Sat oh, and watched cool. it. He's like, I might be the only person that looked at it like with my natural eye and didn't have the like little piece. Was that Teller or was it someone else? I don't was, Teller had the round Jack sunglasses Wade's on, character? right? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that was, was like UV protection was behind Wade, the windshield. Right? Richard Feynman is who he played. Yeah. And yeah. You know, a lot of the marketing for this movie, I think, feel like I, like centered around the explosion. Like they were doing, he he was doing, he was running the press junket about the explosion. Like, mm -hmm. if you yeah. don't have the explosion in this movie, then it's obviously not nearly as effective. But mm -hmm. I thought it like 
lived up to the hype and it was honestly yeah, it not more disappoint. impressive than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Like, that shit was crazy. <laughs> What's even more wild, because you mentioned you went to a full theater. Courtney, I'm sure you saw it in a full theater too. Yeah. I saw it in a full theater, like packed theater, like people standing in the back watching this movie. And when that that moment happened, nothing. Nobody coughed. Nobody sneezed. Yeah. Nobody cleared their throat. There was no noise. And I just remember thinking like that is like that is really something when you can get a whole theater mm-hmm. of I don't know if, even know how many people probably 250 people to just like shut up because they're so like in it like that's really cool. Mm-hmm. And I think that, that brings to mind something that I was like thinking about when you were talking about like the film and how there's no deleted scenes or whatever. This is one of those movies to me where like where you cannot connect with this movie and dislike it, but it's undeniable. Like this yes. movie is an achievement. Like mm-hmm. it's it's just like this is a perfect example of something just being objectively well made. Like when people yeah. say that phrase like, oh it's well made, but I didn't like it. Like this is what like if you didn't like this movie you can't deny you can't come in and be like this is a like a, a piece of crap like someone <laughs> didn't make this well. zero like, stars this is, yeah like it's canceled you can have problems with like the story and stuff like that but i mean it really is like an undeniable thing like just what they're able to pull off in this like the mm-hmm. cast like you said like i think it was the same in my theater when he cuts the sound for the explosion no one did anything like nobody they even were, knew. We were just so <laughs> locked in like yeah <laughs> it's, really it's crazy cool. to think too like they showed that silence for a full like 90 seconds plus and mm-hmm. it didn't feel like it felt long but it didn't feel drawn out it was like the yeah. perfect amount of time yeah okay well let's get into the story we're gonna kind of try to go sequentially mm-hmm. so we've got the backstory part which is like the act one (laughs) and so this is where we get all the backstory of j robert oppenheimer and he's played by killian murphy who i think looks just like him very well cast i want to point out too before we get too much into killian murphy the opening line in the movie is from american prometheus Mm -hmm. and I believe it's Killian Murphy speaking it, but he says Prometheus stole fire from the gods and gave it to man for this. He was chained to a rock and tortured for eternity. And that kind of that for me really like foreshadows like what's about to happen. Oh, like, yeah. Throughout. Which is yeah, watching it the so second crazy. time when that came up on the screen, I was like, oh, shit. What a good <laughs> quote right at the beginning. It was mm-hmm. perfect. perfect. They book yeah. in this movie really well with that. And mm-hmm. the last scene, yeah, the, the, it opens with, like you said, something that leaves you with an impression of the movie right off the bat, and then it leaves you with a scene that sticks with you through the drive mm-hmm. home. Yep, yeah. So we get uh, some time of Oppenheimer's early days, him studying at Cambridge, going to Germany, teaching at Berkeley. Um, At Berkeley, he established during the 1930s the leading American school of theoretical physics. And there he also became deeply involved with social justice causes um, and their advocates, many of whom, unfortunately, were communists. Boo. Well, we also get the scene where he attempts to poison his tutor in Cambridge. (laughs) Yeah, I was like, dude, what the fuck? (laughs) Just poisoning an apple trying to kill your dog and then like almost like yeah you almost killed <laughs> kenneth branagh too you bastard. yeah and nolan like yeah. way minimized that situation in the movie yeah <laughs> yeah like in the book it's crazy like what actually happened in oppenheimer's life so i mean i think they they caught the gravity of what he was doing and how it affected oppenheimer mm-hmm. in his life but like he was kind of fucked up at that time in his life like yeah really yeah it's kind of like what i was saying earlier where they're just trying to show you how all over the place he was yeah he was super troubled yeah yeah and they even do too like there's a scene early on in the movie where you just get him and he's like thinking about something but you hear 
that like stamping in the stands that you mm-hmm. hear later after the bombs are dropped in Japan and they do he does like his speech in front of the people at Los Alamos but you get that audio like way early on in the movie mm-hmm. that's an interesting I I just I think it's so cool how Nolan like pulls in different moments to like foreshadow things yeah, it's like in showing his, his PTSD too because the moment yeah. you're referring to and I can't remember exactly which scene it is but he's like recalling something that happened yeah. like somebody brings up Los Alamos or something and he's like recalling it. And you don't realize that's what's happening at the time. Yeah. But then when you get to the actual scene and hear and see like visually what's happening, you're like, oh, okay. Like that's what that was. It's interesting too to see that they've paralleled the moments in his life when he's having troubles or PTSD and it happens early on in his life when he's just studying. He's like 19 years old and it happens later on in his life when he's still being troubled by his genius brain, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. The weight of being someone. Yeah. Just all of the like choices they make to weave all of that stuff in is like really impressive. And mm-hmm. it just like makes this, you know, not like, uh, I'm trying to think like a beautiful mind or a movie like that, which is like, you know, that's a pretty good movie, but it doesn't nearly have the like, the like daring aspect like i need to tell this in a different way yeah yeah Yeah. so then we have gene tatlock who is played by a girl florence florence Pugh. (laughs) there she is in all her glory so the significance of her in this movie is that she is a communist party member who has a love affair with oppenheimer Mm-hmm. He later also has an affair with Jean, after which he cuts off future meetings with her, and then Jean kills herself shortly after. And so Oppie's haunted by this. Well, he told her that he like wouldn't answer her calls, and so he probably yeah. feels like a little bit responsible. And I, I think he did like truly love her, whereas like Kitty. I'm sure he grew to love Kitty, but like he got Kitty pregnant and that's why they got married. Yeah. Mm. And there's like that whole scene where Florence Pugh is like, she's smart because she's she knows what she wants and she, now she's locked it in. Yeah. Well, she's super troubled too. Like, and I think they do a good job of portraying that side of her. Like she's kind of supposed to be dark and depressed and having her own issues. She's Um, very into him, though. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, he's really into her, always bringing her flowers. Yeah. He's trying to be a good guy. She hates that shit. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And it was great to see Florence in this. I feel like she sometimes picks, makes some odd career choices in terms of the movies that she takes on. And, like, I mean, she's always great, like, everything. But yeah. it's just sort of like it's good to see her work with like a true like master filmmaker like mm-hmm. this. Yeah. And she's done that a couple times. Like, I mean, to me, like her my favorite performance of hers is in Little Women, I think. And like she that's was, her working with a real such a good performance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A real director. Cause it's like, hey, listen, I know you dated Zach Braff, but you don't have to be in the Zach Braff movies. You know, it's like you, you can move on from that one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I thought like like you're saying, she's such like high quality for mm-hmm. her being like relatively new, like in the movie scene. Mm-hmm. Um and it's like people are recognizing that right she's getting like it's it's getting bigger but um what i loved so much is that she's in such a small amount of this movie like teeny tiny minuscule parts in this movie and it's such a huge impact like you mm-hmm. remember yes. florence pew in this movie and you remember her character and details about her character and who her character is and not just because we're like Florence Pugh fangirls but because like she was that good like even if you didn't know who she was you'd like run home and want to figure out who she is well it's important too because her character is really important and significant for the story of Oppenheimer 
because his downfall is ultimately because of his Communist Party affiliations. And she's like one of the biggest ones that he keeps going back to during his time in Los Alamos. And I think they did a good job of casting her as that person because she has to, even though she's in such a small part of this movie, like you said, Liz, like she has to hold such a weight throughout the movie because she holds such an important part in Oppenheimer's mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, and the, she has like visual parts that stick with you, like yes, the, the bathtub scenes, like are just mm, really yes. harrowing. I have two written down. So the first is, I think, a very, very important one, and it's the sex scene where she gets Oppenheimer to read from the. I'm gonna botch this, but Bhagavad Gita, the Hindu scripture that's written in Sanskrit, and. He says, now I'm become death, destroyer of worlds, which he also later says um, at the Trinity test. Pillow mm -hmm. talk, you know. <laughs> yeah, that, casual. Like, What's I hotter than that? That's what I'm into, <laughs> girly. But um, She's so intense. you do you. Also, those sex scenes, the Murphy Pew sex scenes, were the first sex scenes that um, Christopher Nolan's ever done. Yeah. Really, mm -hmm. and <laughs> I don't know if they necessarily worked for me, but they definitely <laughs> <laughs> stuck in your brain because they, they were. They did yeah. stick in your brain. They're some of the more unique <laughs> portrayals of on-screen sex I think I've ever seen in a movie. Yeah. yeah. So the second scene I also have written down is a sex scene, <laughs> and it's particularly. I think there's when two they're... moments where this one shows up in the movie, yeah. but it's the moment where it shows up in Oppenheimer's hearing and then you like Kitty's cut back to him her. and he is all of a sudden naked and then you cut back to him and Florence Pugh is straddling him having sex with him like staring into Kitty's eyes yeah. and I feel like that just said so much about all of the characters in that moment and how their lives were all intertwined and mm -hmm. how much like Kitty had to put up through and it made me feel a lot of sympathy for her in that moment because it was like heart wrenching to hear Oppenheimer talking about his affairs with her, and then yeah, if it just hurt to, like, you, like there. imagine how much it hurt her. I know mm. she's like, we're having to go through this again. Like I already uh, lived this. Like let's yeah. move on. That was one of the choices that I'll admittedly in the moment was like, okay, <laughs> a little, <laughs> little bizarre here, but you know, like there's intentionality the to it, ask. and it's yeah, it's it's. I don't want to use the phrase like aged well, but it's like removed from the actual like the actual act of seeing it on screen and just how mm -hmm. like because it it is bizarre like mm -hmm. for, on and like intentionally it's something that I've like kind of come around on I guess. Yeah, I want to say too. I thought Florence Pugh like looked great, like every <laughs> like her costuming the way they did her mm -hmm. hair like she just like looked aesthetically perfect in my yeah. opinion like for the time period um and just like in general like for today's beauty standards and there's this is gonna be our like pop culture moment after barbenheimer this is like our pop culture moment is that she's getting like a lot of heat uh around the world actually for the way her body looks in these nude scenes That's which insane. i think is just absurd That's um so fucked up <laughs> like first of all like i think she's very comfortable with her body and mm -hmm. like she wouldn't be doing this scene if she wasn't um yep. but just to have people like ragging on her constantly of like her body's like not the ideal female body or like i've seen where people have said something about like her fat rolls being visible, which I didn't what? see any. And just like the body shaming. I just like don't get yeah. it. I thought she looked fabulous and I don't like naked people. So that's saying something. <laughs> so if anything, like Jean is supposed to be like a curvy woman. She's so, just normal. She's a normal person. Yeah. But Oppen or oh, Nolan probably chose angles to like make her look Curvy, curvy like on purpose mm -hmm. and so like if people are like body shaming her because of that like that's garbage she's literally so hot in this movie it's not well even she's funny. people have made like the whole comments about like 
her body not being the right size or like the fat rolls. I don't know where people are finding that, but whatever. Um, she has just come out and said, like, I don't intend on ever changing my body to fit a role. So, like, yeah. I'm Maybe very comfortable because and happy. Killian Murphy <laughs> and his character Oppenheimer was supposed to be playing a 115-pound twig. He's so, like, next. I was about to say, they're going to comment on that shit, but he looks like a pretzel <laughs> stick in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> that was like that i wasn't like my takeaway wasn't like wow florence pew looks i was like sitting there like whoa killian murphy fully <laughs> naked what <laughs> not the best thing i've ever seen <laughs> but he's supposed to be he's supposed to be really yeah yeah thin. like yeah. um They're real people. <laughs> yes is described like, as like he never weighed more than 135 pounds and he was five foot ten so like he was very skinny mm-hmm yeah, yeah I don't I don't I don't get that at all like you're walking into a movie about a theoretical physicist like hoping that you'll see I, I that's really really weird shit like um, you know that's coming from like the nerdy reddit guys that are yeah. like oh like she doesn't look like Barbie she's not mm, like the perfect like weird. anime girly she's a human yeah. woman yeah that that was my pop culture moment. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Defend our girl, Florence. We love you, Florence Pugh. Your body's people beautiful. Can, yeah, people <laughs> get shit from these movies for the weirdest stuff, I will say. Mm-hmm. So next I want to talk about Emily Blunt. So in the movie, Robert marries Kitty Oppenheimer. And Liz, you mentioned um, that because they got pregnant. But she was married to somebody else at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was also a former Communist Party member in a previous marriage. She had had like multiple ma- marriages. Yeah, many. Prior. <laughs> Didn't they all die? Or did I make that up? She got one annulled, one died, and then one she got pregnant with Oppenheimer during. <laughs> yeah. Classic. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we have already established the B critics do not condone baby trapping. <laughs> well, we have established had... that already <laughs> in a previous Official episode. podcast stance. <laughs> she didn't really have any interest in her baby, though. I don't and think she wanted a child. <laughs> I don't think no. she was meant to be a mother. Yeah, they Not like bond the she... baby off onto those right. people, right? Yeah, yeah. they did. Yeah. For a long <laughs> time. That off, happened in real life. 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 Yeah. Like, oh, okay. They actually did. Because she got so overwhelmed by being a mother that like they had to go and like take time. But it didn't happen the same way as the movie portrays it. She Mm-mm. it wasn't because of alcohol or anything like that. She just became overwhelmed and um Robert being a good husband was like, let's take some time, just the two of us. And they went out to Los Alamos before yeah. it was what it was and they just spent time the two of them and came back and it was it was like it was much shorter than what the movie portrays i think it was, it was like, like two a months. couple months yeah okay and then she also did something similar with the child she had in los alamos she had a friend who had recently had a miscarriage watch the baby for a few months while she like went somewhere else can't remember where she went but she had trouble bonding with her children when they were in not everyone's meant to be a mother also I I don't know this personally, but I've heard postpartum depression can do some wild things. Yeah, for so sure. It's understandable. I don't yeah, especially think- when your husband's building the nuclear bomb. Yeah, and you're you know? already dealing with yeah. that shit. Oh my god. <laughs> and your husband's a total fucking like psycho, sort of. Not psycho, but you know. I mean, a little. He was can't, obsessed. Can't, it's probably hard to like, especially when you yourself are a really smart woman mm-hmm. who like knows a lot about you know botany and science and stuff to live with Mm -hmm. someone who's just like crippling under the weight of their own genius while you're trying (laughs) to raise their children like good grief and also still be your own person yeah this isn't your everyday he's not taking the trash out you know (laughs) (laughs) no he's not touching shit there's no dishes being done he's not cooking (laughs) he's not cleaning anything no i do like in their romance how they portrayed the horse scenes which is weird for me to say because i don't particularly like horses but that was a real part of their relationship like riding the horses and riding riding the horses and she was a pretty pretty skilled at horseback riding and i think they made that pretty clear in this movie 
I think another super effective aspect of the way they tell the story of like their romance is like the like like oh yeah like I can shit talk my husband or like tell him what he's doing wrong but the moment someone else does she's like I will fuck you up like yeah yeah like, she's always like riding for him like <laughs> towards out people like they I thought that was like really effective like there's a really really good scene at the end like near the end where Benny Safdie's character is like trying to shake his hand after time has passed and she's like no dog mm-hmm. you're the ops like we yeah. are not we we do not fuck with you <laughs> and she's the My... one who's like really trying to get him to be like in the court case like yo like fight for Stick yourself for and yourself. stuff like that stuff was like definitely easily to me the most effective like aspect of the way they told their relationship my yeah. favorite part like the the part where you really understand like how much they get each other and how much they respect each other is and it's like after the trinity test the whole the whole thing with like bringing in the sheets because he's yeah. really not supposed to tell her, right? He's under this like top secret security clearance. And he, if he didn't have that level of respect for her, he wouldn't tell her anything. But you mm-hmm. understand from that interaction that he's told her everything. She knows everything. And he can't, because the phones are probably bugged and all of that, he can't outright tell her over the phone. But he can give her orders and he can tell her, hey, don't forget to bring the sheets in. And that was like, I don't know. I loved that because I like to think that if Hayden was under a top secret clearance, he would tell me, you know what I mean? Because like he has enough respect for me not to keep me in the He's not getting a top secret clearance now after we release this episode. (laughs) (laughs) Hopefully he's not working on anything like that. Would you still love me if I was inventing the nuclear bomb? (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. I get to be involved, maybe. (laughs) Maybe his version of would you love me if I was a worm? (laughs) Hayden's already established that he would still love me if I was a worm. And he said, too, that he would, like, (laughs) make me, like, a little, like, like, um, terrarium thing and, like, bring other worms in so I would have friends. That's so He would take care of us. (laughs) (laughs) I like how they <laughs> incorporate the take in the sheets moment later too in the movie. And that does kind of show you the respect that they have in their relationship. Sorry. Just a little tidbit about me and my life. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. So I let's like that too. Let's get into this middle part of the movie when they're in Los Alamos and start with Matt Damon, who plays mm-hmm. Leslie Groves. And his character convinces Oppenheimer to lead the Manhattan Project. And then after that is his, like, keeper during the whole Los Alamos project. I had a love-hate relationship with him throughout the entire movie. Really? Yeah. Because his character kind of flip-flops a little bit. Yeah, Matt Damon's really good at playing kind of like a low-key scumbag. Yeah. He's also just playing, like, army Matt Damon in this, you know? Yeah, that's true. kind of... He's never really been like someone I feel like who's well, he's kind of established like what he's gonna be in the movie. Like, you know, you're getting Matt Damon. And that's like a movie star thing. Like Tom Hanks is always just playing Tom Hanks. But now he's Tom Hanks on a boat or now he's cranky <laughs> Tom Hanks. On an or island. Something. Yeah. <laughs> this movie it's like, oh, we get army Matt Damon. But I think like you like you cast him for the reason that he is funny and everyone Mm -hmm. like is drawn to him and like his personality fits the character yeah he takes a little bit of the edge off like because i think without him it becomes like a wow this is really serious like (laughs) yeah and the point of his character is to explain why oppenheimer was chosen to lead mm -hmm. the project despite his leftist background Grove still wanted him to lead the project because of the way he was able to understand the science that surround him and lead other people and inspire others. And um, also because he was the one who like brought quantum physics over to the States. Mm -hmm. So we've got Los Alamos and the set of it is pretty cool. Uh, I don't think they did like the best job they ever could have done with this set. Um, but 
it is just supposed to be like a bunch of rundown buildings kind of in the middle of the desert. So I mean, it's government housing. Yeah. You can't expect much out of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is where it's we probably get really what it looked like. If we're being honest, it's not still there though, but they did um, like figure out exactly where the Trinity test happened and exactly where that bunker was and put it exactly in the location. Oh, that's so cool. That is cool. That's super cool. So that's where we get like the collection of scientists and physicists who start working on making the gadget, as they call it. Mm -hmm. It's a heck of a thing. It's like a a thing. Yeah, it's massive. Like Franken (laughs) bomb. I think one of the two like really like really great things they do in this section of the movie is one the like dropping the marbles into the pole is like a really good like way to of like telling the audience okay like here's how close we're getting to blowing this thing up and then when they actually have the bomb you're like okay that looks like a real fucking bomb like like it they did a really good job of being i was like wow that that definitely could explode and be Mm -hmm. like a real bomb like those were two things that i were like they pulled this off like this looks like it would and like yeah the marble sink to me i thought was just like a really clever wave like like pushing the audience along and mm-hmm. like because there yeah. comes a point in the movie i feel like where you're like okay when are they dropping the bomb <laughs> exactly an hour <laughs> you know? and 58 minutes from this point mm-hmm. yeah. well the, the other thing too is like they didn't really have time to go into a lot of the like manufacturing and engineering efforts around the bomb because they were just so focused on the scientists. But there was like the whole part that America man- American manufacturing had to like pivot towards I I don't even know like uh the what it's called but like uranium. They were like getting it, that and the plutonium like ready for the bomb. And so I think that the little marbles kind of showed like hey, meanwhile, while this is all happening in Los Alamos, there's a whole lot of other things going on in the United States to like make this happen. Mm-hmm. And as it goes along too, they're dropping more and more each time. So it yeah. shows you like how, like that's a really good point you just brought up because like the more attention to those sort of things they show by like, you know, it just feels like each time they're dropping marbles into the bowl, they're dropping a larger collection they're adding more Mm -hmm. like at a time so yeah and i think it also shows how everybody felt at los alamos like i think they felt like such a sense of urgency they were like this is how we're going to end the war this is how we're going to destroy the nazis and that's what they were all working towards and so like everything was like amping up and like everybody was working longer hours and so like it kind of showed you that that was happening with that like very easy visual yeah, I don't know about you, Courtney. The whole time that they were showing like the actual bomb and the setup and how they're moving it and everything, my mind, because I worked like around equipment similar, my mind was thinking about the safety aspect and how there was absolutely no safety involved. <laughs> they had this thing that could blow up and kill tens of potentially hundreds of thousands of people and they're all just mm-hmm. walking around it. They're all just touching it. Nobody's wearing any kind of lead equipment. They're just well, existing around this. Yeah. They show the scene where Oppenheimer like climbs up by himself in his suit. And no one's around. And just like stands there. It's like windy as hell. He's like <sighs> up in this platform thing, like just mm-hmm. staring at the bomb, like three inches from it. And I'm like, the what are you not doing? Function like you don't even know if it works. <laughs> You've got Groves over here telling you like you can't fly, you can't be on a plane, you can't even drive, and you're up there like looking at this bomb. Like that's not the move, sir. Uh, <laughs> like no, yeah, that's just straight movie bullshit right there. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Definitely. that's like actually how they did it though. Like not gonna lie, at that time the safety was like so many people had to go through some crazy stuff for safety measures to be where they are now. So I'm sure there was no safety. They probably they had were the little unconcerned. Lenses. What did they call them? Your when they were like the handing them out. Finder things. I know, but they had like a like a fun little like wartime name that I can't remember. I don't. Uh, know. I don't know. You can Google it. But they, um, yeah, I don't know. The safety was 
bothering me and this thing was like so so heavy and like their feet would be under it they were like manhandling it i was like that would never fly today never ever in a million years would that be allowed i think there was a lot of stuff that happened during that whole science project that wouldn't be allowed today like from that to like all the people that they had involved with it right like i think they were just like we're we need this to happen it was like the wild west out there i love the use of the term science project like they're gonna (laughs) set up like a trifold (laughs) cardboard thing (laughs) science fair time the atomic bomb (laughs) so we did already talk a lot about the Trinity test scene itself. So I don't know if there's anything else y'all want to say about that scene in particular. I don't think but there's so. a lot that either. happens um, around, like after that happens, around the bombs being dropped. And one thing I think that's really interesting about this movie is that they never actually show the bombs that are dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We only get the one like Trinity test scene. You don't see them like go off. Yeah, you don't see them. Yeah. Well, they do show them driving away on the trucks. Yeah, but like the only like true nuclear bomb visual that you get is the test. Yeah. Which I don't know about y'all. Great choice. I didn't want to see that agree. shit. Just from a respect standpoint. Yeah, yeah. I don't know anyone who wants to see that. Like, they they give you a little bit of of it, and yeah, in his speech, where they're showing some that that was like some kind of jarring. Those were real pictures too. Yeah. That were taken after the fact. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad they made the choice to not do that. I don't see any avenue in which that would have been successful mm-hmm. or a nope. good choice. Everyone knows what happened. Like, yeah. we don't need that recalled. And also, this movie's not about that. Like, it's about yeah. like everything leading up to that, and then like what happened as like the down, the back fall, mm-hmm. or what, fallout, or whatever you call mm-hmm. it from it. It's a lot not of about it... like that actual like that one moment. Yeah, but a lot of it is about <clears throat> like. Oppenheimer, his decisions leading up to that about the dropping of those bombs and then his thoughts afterwards about you know, kind of like how he feels he was fooled and um, the things that come out like after that. Like I think there is a lot of commentary on like the arms race that happens after that because of the decision to drop those bombs. Well, mm-hmm. I think that the reason why you're like you get the feeling that he felt like he was fooled is I think he thought like the actual Oppenheimer thought he was going to have more say like his input was going to mean more than it did when it came down to them like actually dropping the bomb and he was like you know maybe we like rethink this like well we can just parade around that we have these bombs like why we got to actually use them and they were like no we don't care you have to say we're doing it yeah and what they also show in the movie is they show, you know, the race initially is all like we've got to beat the Nazis because we've got to, mm-hmm. you know, beat the Nazis. Well, then the Nazis, you know, are they surrender. Hitler kills himself. The Nazis surrender. And they do show, you know, the scientists being like, I don't know if we should like keep making this bomb. And then they show the Japanese, they pivot to Japan. And Oppenheimer is being fed this information that like, we're never there's no way we can win this war without these bombs um well, and not that's that like there's no way but a lot of people like are gonna, gonna die surrender. yeah a lot of people are gonna die it's not gonna be like an easy we're not gonna walk in and they're gonna throw their hands up like they're mm-hmm. willing to fight for this just like we are yeah and by doing this we're saving the lives of american people which yeah we, we don't know we'll never know well they do comment on that in the book and so, like, Japan was actually, like, in surrender talks with the negotiations. U.S. Negotiations at the time. And they were, like, getting ready to surrender. So it it I think they do a good job in the movie of kind of talking about, like, all the decisions that went around going ahead and dropping the bomb. Because there's arguments on both sides, right? There's, like, oh, you didn't have to do that and kill so many innocent people. Like, they would have surrendered on their terms or whatever. But then there's also the side of it that we're going to get into, which is about like the potential for like a really scary arms race 
after the fact if you didn't show that like, hey, America has this bomb and this is what we're we're capable of basically. But also sh- like this is what this is what these do. Like yeah. it's mm-hmm. not just all these countries just dropping them willy nilly. Like you showed, okay, like this is the destruction that these cause. It's not just like a silly little bomb. It's like the the bomb. Mm-hmm. It's honestly kind of like an insane piece of history that yes. this even happened. Like everything yeah. is different after that. There's yeah. before a, yeah. and there's after. They get a they do a good job of like making you be like, geez, that's fucked up. Like one super effective line is when they're having the discussion about like you know, they're in the room with all of those government officials and military people and they're like discussing about like where they should drop it or if they should drop it and that guy's like, Oh, we shouldn't drop it here because like my family vacations there. Yeah. Stuff. It's like that's one of the more effective lines in the whole movie because you're yeah. just like, good grief. Like that's yeah. Like, you know, whenever you come out when someone makes a movie like this about someone who's like controversial or like there's always like the like, oh, why should they even make this? Like this is like damaging. But it's like you can make and tell someone's story and about an event without being directly in support of it. I think this movie mm-hmm. does a good job of like yeah. showing both sides. Discussing all of those things. Like mm-hmm. this is a fully fleshed out account, it feels like. Yeah. yeah. So we get that. Yeah. So we get that scene with um that's with Henry Stimson. And that's where they're like trying to figure out what they're going to recommend to the president and Oppenheimer kind of gets to like help select the target cities a little bit. Then we get when the bombs are dropped. So in the movie, what they show is like Oppenheimer is anxiously like awaiting a call from Groves about whether or not the bombs were dropped. And then finally you hear Truman come on the radio through the Los Alamos loudspeakers announcing the drop of the atomic bomb. On Hiroshima. My heart was like racing. I was like, like, yeah. Tell me it doesn't actually happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the speech after that's a really effective. I was going to say, like, this performance by Killian Murphy is super impressive because he's on screen the entire time. And I think there are a lot of comparisons to be made about other past movies where the central performance is like of this caliber but i feel like one thing that kind of distincts this movie and is like he doesn't really get the big like yelling thing that a lot of like you know one that comes to mind is like there will be blood like daniel day lewis gets so many scenes in that where he's like screaming and yelling at people and you're like whoa real acting but this is (laughs) a really like nuanced performance for someone who's at the center of a movie but the speech, I feel like, is the like, yeah, like that's the like. Remember who is playing the lead role in this movie, and remember mm-hmm. who we're hanging this movie on. Like, and I think it's incredible because that is exactly how Oppenheimer is described. Like he is mm-hmm. quiet, and pe- he's com- but he's commanding, and people hush mm-hmm. up when he's in the room talking at his low volume. And so to see it like after that crazy event. And he's just talking at like a normal volume, but he commands the attention of the whole community is, I think that was really well done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the way that they like showed it being like, he felt like he was in a fever dream. Like I felt like I was in it too, like just saying what he knew he had to say, like whether or not he agreed with it or believed in it. But he was like, I have to do this for these people so that they don't feel what I'm feeling kind of thing. Yeah, that was so crazy too. Like when he, there was a moment when he was like walking away and you saw him kind of like step and like his foot got caught. And it was like, it it was almost like the people from the actual events in Japan were like flashing into the moment, like kind of like he was in a fever dream. He was like imagining what those people are going through and what's happening to them in yeah. that moment. Mm-hmm. Yep. So we get two other scenes. So one is when Oppenheimer goes and he talks to the president, Truman, played by Gary Oldman. Mm -hmm. Truman. They really dunk on him in this movie, don't they? I don't know about you. The world dunks on him. But like, yeah, like they, (laughs) 
not a positive outlook of President Truman in this movie, which no. I, I don't have the historical <laughs> knowledge to know how accurate that is or whatever, but I was just walking away like, look at that scumbag. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't really know. I mean, I'm actually like at this part in the book right now when they're like talking about like the decision to drop the bombs. And so it is really interesting that like this guy is like the guy that made that decision and mm-hmm. you see him meet up with Oppenheimer who's like the one that made it happen and made him capable of having that ability. And I thought it was kind of funny too how he was like <laughs> he was like don't ever bring that cry baby back here ever again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know that that's how Truman actually was, but I, I have no idea. I do believe the whole idea that he like took on the grief and was like, like I did this. And oh yeah, like people are gonna hate me for it, but like I'm gonna own that. Like I think that that's probably pretty true. Yep. So the last third of the movie, because that really only wraps up like hour two. So we've got another hour left and it mostly focuses on the two hearings. So throughout the movie, um, we switch between Strauss's hearing to become a presidential cabinet member and then Oppenheimer's hearing to appeal the loss of his security clearance. And they happen at different times in history, but really in that last hour of the movie, you switch a lot between the two. Um, And then one thing to note is that neither are a trial neither have a burden of proof, just the possibility of denial. And um, it's really interesting the juxtaposition between the two because one's a big theatrical thing with press members and everything and then purposefully behind closed doors they kind of Mm -hmm. blowball Oppenheimer in a room that's just him and a kangaroo court basically yeah yeah Yeah, you feel really bad for oppenheimer in that moment like while as you're like watching because like i i don't know about you guys i didn't know all the details of his trial and they're like pretty accurate um depictions of like what he went through and how he was treated during the whole it's not trial you said it's not a trial but like whatever his appeal yeah and it was like completely unnecessary they could have just told him like you don't have an option to appeal it because he was never it was he was never given a fair chance he was never going to get a fair chance but just the fact that they like drug him through all of that to beat him down like Mm -hmm. yeah really sucks it was a shellacking (laughs) yeah for sure and the you know, this is where I guess people are divided on. Some people don't really like this section of the movie. I thought it was, I liked it. It, it I thought it was captivating. I and mean. I think one of the large parts of that is because Robert Downey Jr. is such a good actor. Yes. And we, I mean, like, you know, Marvel movies are fun and everything, but mm-hmm. we missed so much time of getting to see him and stuff like this. Like, yeah, we could have gotten. You know, I mean, he's he's obviously just like really great as Tony Stark, and like part of the reason why those movies kind of suck now is because he's not in them. Oh. And like, but just think about like how many of these great performances we could have gotten if he wasn't just like in a warehouse in Atlanta for thirteen years. Like, it's kind of the same conversation we had about <laughs> Chris Evans with yeah. Knives Out. Like, yeah. so good, and like just not able yeah. to be in a role not that utilized lets him shine because this is yeah like chris Ev- like to me this is almost different because like chris evans i feel like you always kind of knew he was like charismatic and stuff mm-hmm. like so when he's in knives out like it, to me that wasn't a big shock for me someone growing up like didn't really know like haven't seen a lot of Robert Downey Jr. performances like outside of the realm of Marvel, Other which is Iron probably Man. a big, yeah, like which is probably a big blind spot for me. But like I people of our generation, break in his career though, because didn't yeah. he have like a period of like drug use where he wasn't yeah. and stuff? And so I think that that could be contributing to it too. Yeah, and I think like when you like watch him in this movie, you're truly reminded of just like how much of a presence and how good of an actor. Yeah. He is because he is fucking fantastic in this movie. And yeah. like it 
I mean, if I, I would slap money on him, like, potentially winning an Oscar, I would think that he's going to run up against some other, like, strong candidates, too. But I mean, Have I you seen like the memes that are, like, bigger. best supporting yeah. actor this year is going to be between Robert Downey Jr. and Ryan Gosling? <laughs> yeah. I believe And it. we're about to get Yorgos Lanthimos as Poor Things, which I think yes. is going to have, like, a so ton of He's acting so buzz, yeah, like... Yeah, there's going to be a lot of acting, like, nominations, I think, coming from that one. And mm -hmm. Killers of the Flower Moon, too, will get a De Niro mm -hmm. supporting performance, which is going to be... Leo. Yeah. Like, but he Lots in this movie, I mean... Yeah, he in this movie, like, he holds... I think he makes the third act as powerful as it is. Like, he's so yeah. captivating and slimy mm -hmm. and... He almost like, feels like a main character. Yeah. Even though like he's not, but he almost feels like he is. Yeah, like conversely I mean, I, I to he what definitely I was definitely does. Yeah, conversely to what I was talking about with Killian Murphy, how quiet and nuanced his performance is outside of moments here and there, they were really given down like Robert Downey Jr. like speeches and stuff mm -hmm. to chew on and like he's yelling and being really gripping. Like that's it's a real capital A acting mm -hmm. performance yes. from him. Yeah. So the big debate that's interwoven between him and Oppenheimer throughout the movie is this H bomb or no H bomb. And it discusses the arms race of the 1950s and Oppenheimer's activism after the bombings, where he kind of flipped and now was against the idea of utilizing these weapons or building up an arms um like an h-bomb program where strauss was on the other side yeah that was part of the movie that uh, was a little bit lost on me for like a second or two i was like okay i don't really get what's going on but i know like one of the big portions that they're trying to drive home is that oppenheimer's like comments and that one hearing or whatever or really what mm -hmm. set Strauss off on this like path of vengeance and yeah with the isotopes and ultimate yeah like ultimately like ended up destroying both of their careers like this yeah, one crazy. thing that you probably in the moment didn't even really think would have been a big deal and it kind of unraveled mm -hmm. both of their lives and it really does have big consequence like I know they talked about it with that whole isotopes thing and like basically showing it as Louis Strauss, like holding a grudge on Oppenheimer, but there was so much um, commentary on the things that people were doing in politics, like after the war and after the use of the bomb. And I think they showed it too with like Oppenheimer's discussions with Einstein. That was like all throughout the movie where, you know, we talked about how they showed it like right at the beginning but then they had moments where he would go back to Einstein and discuss this like possibility of a chain reaction that could happen and ignite the atmosphere and that was destroy the whole world. For me. I didn't know that that was like ever a possibility of something like that happening, mm -hmm. and yeah. I was like, no way, no way that they thought that this might actually happen, and they're just gonna like set this bomb off. Yeah, and they still did it. What a bunch of fuckers. they still did it. <laughs> Two zero. They're like, meh, we might just Two destroy zero. the earth, but who knows. Zero. There was a scene worth trying. <laughs> yeah. There was a scene like kind of at the end where they show a visual of the world like as if it's getting like the bomb mm -hmm. is going off and it's like taking over the whole world. Mm -hmm. And that was a crazy visual. I was sitting there like, oh my God. Like what if this had happened and I like wasn't sitting here today watching this movie? Well, and that's know. why we're so appreciative of this being a <laughs> Nolan movie because he yeah. can do stuff like that. Like, yeah. that's what takes this movie from being just, you know, like J. Edgar or whatever that one movie of Leonardo DiCaprio is. Like, I'm just trying to think of random biopics to mm -hmm. next level stuff. Like, like Johnny yeah. Cash's Walk the Line. Yeah, yeah, like something like that. Where it's just like, like Here's what happened in their lives. but it's not yeah. like this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. So then we get the mystery revealed at the end. Strauss did, in fact, work to get Oppenheimer's security clearance 
revoked. We all knew it. Yeah. We saw it. We saw right the through his screen. little spoke screen. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And they give Rami Malik the speech after just like him just like being. <laughs> there was like a point where I was like, okay, of all the people in this movie, why is he in this movie? And then he, because he does there nothing. And then, mm-hmm. and then he shows up. They pull the old bait and switch and he gets to deliver. They're like, oh yeah, we have a best actor winner in our cast at our disposal. Let's give him this incredible. And he's so fucking good. And it too. Some like, Neville Longbottom shit right there. Yeah, yeah. He was oh, the chosen yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good that's a good comparison, Liz. Okay. All right. So I think we've made it through. Mm-hmm. That was a it's time for a game. Do we get to play a game? Yeah. So we're gonna play this game. It's I I've made it up. It's called Fact or Fiction. Okay. And I'm going to tell you something that happened in the movie and you're going to tell me whether you think it actually happened in real life or if it was fictionally made up for drama. Okay, we should take turns. So Matt, you answer the first one, I'll answer the second one. Well, first. you can both answer. Just one Yeah, like we both time. give our answer and then she tells us the real one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this first one, um and we talked about the scene, but Henry Stimson spared Kyoto because he honeymooned there. I'm going to go fact, fact on that one. So that one is actually fiction. What? Damn. Um, that was just put in there for dr- drama. Um, and the decision to drop the bombs where they did was like far more nuanced and delicate. I think that, that I, I read that. I then. <laughs> I feel like um, maybe somebody else said it. Like maybe it wasn't <clears throat> him who said it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that it may have just been like a hearsay, like so and so said, like this. Yeah. Like, it might have been like a joke kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next one. Oppenheimer delivered a lecture in Dutch just six weeks after arriving in Holland. Fact. I'm gonna go fact on that one. Too. Yeah, it is fact. Yeah. And um, Oppenheimer said, "I don't think it was very good, but it was appreciated." Oh. So. <laughs> All right, next. Oppenheimer did try to poison his tutor while at Cambridge. Fact. Fact. Yeah, he did. Um, The only part of it that was fiction is that Bohr was never involved, that scientist. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, Kenneth Branagh, that's right. Yeah, and then when Cambridge officials found out about it, Oppenheimer's dad had to, like, call in a favor to convince them not to expel him. And said he was yep. put on probation and he had to go to a psychiatrist. Yeah. Wow. I'm kind of glad they didn't incorporate that into the movie. It was like a lot of unnecessary details. Yeah. I think they, they showed with special effects, which was way cooler to watch, that he was kind of crazy at this time. Mm-hmm. All right. I have two more. So the next one is no one noticed the Trinity test in neighboring cities. Ooh. I'm going to go fiction on that one. Yeah. Fiction. Yeah. So the test um, did blow out windows in nearby cities and people in Amarillo, Texas, which is 280 miles away, said that they saw the brightness from the blast. Amarillo. Um, I used to live there. To get around telling all these people about what was going on at Los Alamos, the government planted a story that an ammunition magazine had exploded, but no one was injured. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Government right. can get away with fucking Americans anything. are so gullible. Mm-hmm. All right. I mean, what what would you think? Like, yeah, you don't yeah. even know what that would work on me for nuclear sure. Nuclear bomb like, is. You're like, oh yeah, oh, yeah that makes sense. <laughs> that'd work on me, and then someone would make a TikTok that's like, "This is what actually happened." I'd be like, "You're a moron. That's not what happened." <laughs> I would immediately <laughs> believe them and send it to somebody, and they'd be like, "Courtney, that's fake." And I'd be like, "Oh, my okay, my bad." All right, last one. Uh, a thunderstorm delayed the Trinity test. Ooh, that feels like fact. All right, for the sake of not doing the same answer every time I go fiction. All right, so that is a fact. Fuck. Um, <laughs> the real Trinity test was delayed one and a half hours due to weather. Um, the difference is that there was an entire meteorology team on site evaluating the weather that made the call. To not m- just to Oppenheimer. Move the test. 
Yeah, being he like, wasn't I know just the like, land. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it'll, be, it'll break back my hand. hand. <laughs> yeah, I can feel the I can feel the heartbeat of the desert. <laughs> yeah, I did read too oh, um, that the like lieutenant or colonel who have whoever was like telling them they had to get this test done had told that the head meteorologist that if they were wrong that that uh, one of them was going to have to give up their head for it. So, wow. Yep, that's my game. Intense. You guys did good. I didn't trick you that too was bad. So fun. Yeah. We should play that every episode. <laughs> well, <laughs> every, oh. every for a um, for a completely fictionist movie. <laughs> yeah. Fact or fiction? Yeah. Every time it's like a historical type movie, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Maybe some okay. of our period pieces. Well, I think it is time to rate the movie. Mm. So, as always, we rate our movies through Letterbox, zero to five stars with half star increments. And Matt, you are up first. Okay, for me, I'm sticking by my initial rating, which is I think this is five stars. Like, this is 1A, 1B with past lives for my favorite movie of the year so far. I think both of those are five star movies. And I think acting, storytelling, editing, score. Everything about this movie is just a real achievement. I think he, he really, he did it. He did the thing. <laughs> he did it. Yep. <laughs> yep. Okay, Liz. So I gave this one four and a half stars. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Um, I fully plan on watching it again. I will probably, it'll probably be one of those that I like will own the DVD and watch over and over again. I'm just like, mm-hmm. so it's i i don't think if i wasn't like as much of a like world war ii stan i don't think that i would have enjoyed it as much but i just like love like learning about that history and i read books about it and all that kind of stuff so yeah i have stars i thought you gave it um five stars did you change your Oh, I might rating? have given it five. I don't know. I haven't looked at my rating recently, so it's probably oh, a five okay. star. We got to change it to four and a half star now. That's your belief. No, it's five. We're leaving it at five. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> five so stars. I gave this movie four stars. Mm-hmm. And the reason I gave it four stars is because I think of like Florence Pugh and Emily Blunt and the way that they were just portrayed as like crazy I think it like turned me off a little bit the first time I watched it. However, I feel like after having discussed it and having like read the book and once I finish the book, I'm probably going to go see it again. And I have a feeling that like my rating is going to change. And like I also feel like the fact that I want to go see it again for a third time kind of makes it feel like I should be rating. You're going to sit through this movie for nine hours. (laughs) <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um so stay tuned but when i did leave the theater on sunday which was three days ago i did rate it four stars again but i also like immediately downloaded the book like from audible like while i was in the parking intrigued. lot of amc so m- i'm curious if like watching it with all this context i'll be like wow like he portrayed all of this like so well like i don't know we'll see all right, so we're starting something a little different um, in some of our episodes, and maybe we'll keep doing this. Um, so, like, y'all let us know if you like it or don't like it. But we put up a story asking y'all to write in and tell us uh, what you thought about the movie. And so I'm just going to, like, read a few of these. So the first one I have agrees um, with you, Matt. It's from an account called Rank It Up. And they said, filmmaking at its finest. Nolan crushed it. Killian for Oscar. <laughs> Killian for Oscar. <laughs> I feel like he's going to win. Yeah, I, I have a hard time imagining a world where he doesn't. Mm-hmm. He'll, yeah. he'll be up against Leo and probably Bradley Cooper, too. But we'll see. And what's her face from the Barbie movie? Margot Robbie. Yeah. Mm. But she'll be an actress, though. So. Yeah. She oh, yeah. It's a different that category. I'm yeah. stupid. Okay. It is kind of weird they do that. <laughs> I wonder if they'll ever change that. No. They've changed it in some award shows where it's 10 performances and they recognize two regardless of gender, I think. Interesting. That's cool. Neat. All right. So the next one's just kind of funny, but I agree with it. So I'm going to read it. 
Um, it's from The Lazy Binge. And they said, Killian Murphy makes my mouth water heavily. Incredible movie. <laughs> That's an interesting take. <laughs> His eyes looked incredible in this. He's got great yeah, they eyes look cool. and facial really structure. Eyes. High cheekbones. Um, and then our boy Dan Loves Film wrote in and he said, was excellent. A real achievement to make a three-hour film of mostly people talking in rooms, engaging. True. That is so yeah. true. Yep. And then the last one is a Barbenheimer reference and it's from an account called Cine Egg. And they said peak, but Barbie was peaker. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so there it is. Hey, thanks for thanks for everybody who wrote in. I, I had so much fun reading through these. Um, I love this section. Hopefully, we'll make it like a thing. So y'all, let us Liz, know if you like it or don't like it, and we'll keep doing it. Yeah, Liz, I'll save your voice and I'll read the like what the internet thought of this or what the world, it. I guess. So our letterboxed average is 4.3 out of 5, um, which almost exactly goes with kind of like where we're at. Mm -hmm. Tomato meter, 93%. Audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, 91%. Those are some pretty good scores. Mm -hmm. We've got IMDb, 8.6 out of 10, and then 93% of Google users liked the movie. So all good things, all, all good things. Yeah. <laughs> Very well Universally liked. beloved. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be a classic one day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can feel it in my bones. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fun. Okay. That is all. Matt, I think it is time to say goodbye to you. Thank you yeah, again awesome. for coming on and talking about a movie with us. We love having yeah, you on. Yeah, of course. This is was, this was great. This is, of the three, probably my favorite movie that we've done, I think. Yeah. So. It's a good one. That was a great. <laughs> yeah thanks for having me on as always thanks for coming on it was fun <laughs> bye and now we have to sign off and say bye to y'all yeah so thanks for tuning in to our Oppenheimer episode um, don't forget to leave us a rating and a review drop us a comment on YouTube and then leave us an answer to our poll and Q&A section on Spotify if I remember to put it up <laughs> and you can find more information about the podcast and our whole podography on our website becritics.com or you can find links to all the things in our episode show notes. And then next week, we're going to be discussing, you guessed it, another Florence Pugh movie. We just love her so much that we're going to do five whole movies. And our next one is Midsommar, which is a little bit different from our usual content. Um, but we're going to be taking it on with our friend Lewis, who runs um, the movie of the day uh, blog. He does movie reviews. It's kind of like a personal film blog, but we had a blast talking with him. We can't wait for all of you to hear it as well. It's pretty exciting. Plus, there's some fun news coming with that episode, so yeah. you are not going to want to miss it. Yeah. So definitely be sure to subscribe and follow and all the things so that you don't miss that episode because it is a really, really good one. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. All right. I think that's all we have for today. So we'll see you all in the next one. Bye, guys. Bye.